there can be so many project management terms and words and phrases it can definitely be overwhelming. So I am here to teach you all the lingo. Here are my top 10 terms that project managers use. Stay tuned. Well, hello, YouTube family. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Christina, and this is Cultivated Chrissy. Now, in today's video, I'm going to be teaching you my top 10 PM terms. Now, these are the terms that project managers use most often. Um, these terms, if you know them, it's going to help you to be more successful in your project delivery. And like I said, it could be so overwhelming to know all these terms. So I'm going to be teaching you the top 10 ones that you need to know. So let's jump right into it. So the first term is project life cycle. Now I already talked about this in my last two videos, so you wanna make sure you go ahead and watch that. I will link them down below for you, but this is a foundational one, okay? You need to understand this, whether you're doing waterfall projects or agile projects, right? You wanna understand the project life cycle. And it basically helps you to understand how you go through the project from beginning to end, right? Initiation to close. So those five phases are initiate, plan, execute, monitor and control, and close, and I will go through them in more detail in a second. Like I said, you can do the project life cycle for both waterfall and agile projects. For the waterfall project, right, you're essentially going through one big round um, of the project, right, of the project sequence. Um, it's a very sequential, right, one phase after the next. And then once you get to the close, the project is completed. Now for agile, right, you're going through those five phases in multiple iterations, right? At the end of each iteration, you have one piece of the larger project. Once you complete all of the different rounds, right, or sprints, um, then you'll have your completed project, right? Your end, end product service or result that the project is supposed to have at its completion. So that is the project life cycle. Let's go through each of the phases. So the first phase of the project life cycle is to initiate, right? This helps you to know the who, what, when, where, why, and how of your project, right? And you wanna document that in a project charter, in a stakeholder matrix, right? Those are the two processes within the initiation phase. And you wanna make sure that you have that direction, right? That goal defined. You don't just jump into a car, start it and drive, right? You need to know where you're going. Um, and so this helps you to define that so that you have that clear direction going into the next phases of the project. So plan is the second phase in the project life cycle. And keeping with that car analogy, now you know where you're going, right? If you've initiated correctly, you know where you're going, you know what address you're trying to get to, right? You know the overall goal. You go ahead and type that into the GPS and your step-by-step -step directions pop up, right? This is the planning phase. You need to kind of define how you're going to get there, right? And there are two tracks for this. Let's get into that. So the two tracks that are involved within the planning of a project is one, the more obvious one, right? You're going to plan out how you're going to deliver the end product service or result of your project, right? How are you going to achieve the overall goal of the project? You define those steps, right? Um, but then the less obvious one is how you're gonna actually conduct the project, right? What forums are you going to communicate um, with? How are you gonna budget, right? What tools are you going to use? How are you going to, um, and how are you going to mitigate the risks on your project? All of that, right? So one track is the actual step-by-step -step on how you're going to deliver the project, right? And then the second track is actually how you're going to conduct the project. All of that goes into the planning phase of the project. So you want to make sure you do both during this phase. So the next phase, the third phase, is to actually execute, right? So you have those step-by-step -step directions popped up and now it's time to follow them, right? Um, it's time to action that plan, go through, complete the activities, on time, within scope, on budget, right? Within the triple constraint, we'll get to that later. Um, but now it's just time to take action and follow the plan. So monitor and control. This is the fourth phase of the project life cycle. And to describe this, 
I'll continue this card analogy, right? Say you're driving and you make a wrong turn, right? You go off track, the GPS reroutes, right? It finds the best route to get you back on track, right? Um, another example is you're driving and an accident happens, right? And your time increases on when you're going to get there, right? You're gonna get there late, right? The GPS reroutes, it gives you some alternative routes, right? To help you get around the traffic um, and, and hopefully still get there on time, right? So this is very similar to what you're doing in the monitoring control phase, right? Things are going to happen on your projects. Risks may come to fruition, right? You may have issues pop up, um, staffing issues, things like that pop up and you have to figure out how to stay on track, right? You're looking at your projects closely. You're watching the activities, making sure things are done on time. And if they're not, what's impacting that, right? It's really being a problem solver, right? Being proactive, staying on top of things, staying on top of your team and being quick to come up with solutions should things take place, right? That's what monitoring control is all about. And it's extremely important to do so, right? Same thing when it comes to changes on the project. If something has been decided that it's going to change, you need to understand what are the impacts going to be of that change, right? We look at everything in terms of scope, time, and budget, right? Your triple constraint. And again, I will get into that shortly, um, but you want to make sure you know how things are going to impact um, the project. And so all of this is about keeping a close eye. Very important step. So the next and final phase of the project life cycle is to close, okay? So keeping up with this analogy, you've driven and followed the step-by-step -step directions that your GPS pulled up. You may have gotten off track, but you came back on track and you reached your destination. But you wanna make sure that you're in the right place, right? That you didn't drive all this way for nothing. What you drove all this way for, they're actually providing that, right, at this place. It's meeting your needs, right? And it's going to be the same thing for your project. You want to look at all of what you produced, right? Compare that, you know, you and the final reviewer compare that against the acceptance criteria for each of the deliverables that was already defined, right? And you want to make sure that this is meeting the need, right? What was the overall goal? And do we have that here in front of us, right? Um, if you had any contracts open, you want to look at each of the deliverables, each of the metrics on the contract and make sure that those were actually delivered upon, right? And you want to close those things out, you know, make sure payment is done, all of that stuff. We're closing things out, right? True to the name. But if you uh, need to put certain things into operations, right? Meaning that it's going to be something that's used on a daily as a result of this project. You want to make sure there's going to be a new owner for that, right? And it's called transference. You want to make sure that you're transferring the deliverables of this project to a rightful owner, to a new owner, because you don't want that to be you, right? Your work is going to be done after this. And if you don't transfer things properly, then people are going to keep coming to you. So you want to make sure that you do that. So again, this is the project life cycle. This is a foundational framework that you really need to know and truly understand. Um, and understanding this is definitely going to help you in your project delivery. So that was the project life cycle. Let's get into the second term. So the second term is stakeholders. Now, I will probably already use this a million times, right? But here I'm going to actually define it. Um, your stakeholders are those people on your project that are indirectly and directly affected or impacted or involved in your project, right? And you wanna make sure that you really are thoughtful in who these people are, right? Not just the people, again, that are directly involved, but those that are gonna be indirectly involved, right? And impacted by this work. Um, you also want to make sure that you're including your customer voice, right? Or VOC, voice of customer, right? You wanna make sure that you're doing that. Um, for example, I did a sickle cell project, um, you know, a few years ago, and we made sure that on the project we had patients that had sickle cell on the project, right? Um, it was really important and foundational that we heard from them. So make sure when you're picking your stakeholders that you're really thinking thoughtfully about who that is and including the customer. So if you've ever heard of a RACI, right, this can help you to also define who your stakeholders are. This tells you who's responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed on the project. It doesn't include the voice of the customer. So again, make sure you do that, but it can help you to start to think about who's involved in that. 
Now, defining stakeholders is really, really important when it comes to the people side of change, right? I talk about change management, and that's really you looking at any changes that come up on a project, but there's another change management as well, and that is the people side of change, right? When you're delivering a project and you have a new product or service offering, right, there are staff members that are going to have to implement that, right? There are people that are going to have to change how they've been working, right, add to their roles, all of that. So people are going to also have to change as a result of what you're doing, right? So we want to make sure, right, that we're looking at that as well, looking at how they're going to change and making sure we're speaking to them throughout the project about this, making sure we tell them what's in it for them, all of that, right? Um, so that's going to be key. Again, you need to know who these people are, put them on your stakeholder matrix because we're going to need to develop a communication plan um, to include them in as we implement this project. So communication is the number one reason why projects fail, okay? So I'm stressing the people side of change because your customers also include your internal customers, right? Which are your employees, your staff members. They are your internal customers. Um, and so we wanna make sure that that communication is tight. And if you don't include them on the stakeholder matrix, you're probably gonna forget that they too need communication, all right? So let's jump into tip number three. So let's jump into the third term, and that is project charter. Now, you're not going to want to skip this step, right? Again, you don't drive a car without direction, okay? This gives you the who, what, when, where, why, and how of your project. You document this, and it's something that you can reference throughout the project. But believe you me, you do not want to skip this, because if you do, you're going to be in meetings and people are like, why are we doing this again? Why do we even need to do this? What are we trying to accomplish? And it's so it's extremely annoying and you're going to have to go back and forth with people trying to remember what was the whole purpose of this? Why are we doing this? It's better to just document it. OK, a great project charter will have all this information for them in a one quick two one to two pager um, where you can have all of this information. OK, so please do not skip this step. You will definitely regret it. And make sure you guys go ahead and subscribe because in my next video, I'll be talking all about the project charter. I'm going in depth about each section, what you're supposed to do to complete it, all of that. And I have a template that I've actually created as well that goes in depth on how to complete each section. I have prompting questions that you can use when facilitating the a meeting to gather this information from leadership all of that, okay? So it gives you directions on how to complete it, prompting questions that you can ask people to answer the questions, and all of that is available in the template. I will go ahead and link that for you guys below. But don't skip this project charter, okay? It's gonna make your life harder. Don't make your life harder. So the fourth term is deliverable, okay? Again, I briefly touched on this in a previous video, but you're going to wanna know the term deliverable, right? Because this is telling you what are the outputs of this project, right? And you can have multiple deliverables or multiple outputs in your project that are all going to contribute to you being able to achieve the overall goal of the project, right? Um, and so, you know, I spoke about the sickle cell project. so you know, rolling on this again, right, in the sickle cell project, we needed to develop a care plan for them, right, that physicians would use when speaking with the, with the patient, and then they could take that home and figure out how to action it if they're in pain, right, what steps should they be taking. Um, so we needed to actually develop the questions for the care plan and then the action items for that. We had to speak to the patients themselves, we had to speak to the physicians, understand best practices, all of that. So that's a deliverable in itself. And then we needed to go ahead and integrate that care plan into the electronic health, health record, right? So that's another deliverable. Um, all of this contributed to the overall goal of having a care plan developed for the sickle cell anemia patients, right? That physicians can go ahead and use and they can take home. Um, so again, multiple things within that, all contributing to the overall goal of the project, right? So that is deliverables. So the next term is WBS or work breakdown structure. Now this is a high level plan for your project, right? But it's not a full project schedule schedule that has durations and responsibilities and time frames um, and predecessors. It doesn't have all of that in there, right? It mostly has the activities and I'll tell you which ones. It can either be deliverable based like this care plan that I talked about, or it could be a phase based um, work breakdown structure, like when you're constructing a house, right? Um, and so those are the two ways you can write it. For me, I mostly do deliverable based, but it really is going to depend on the project itself, what is best for the project and how best to illustrate how you're going to implement it. 
Now, the work breakdown structure is really cool because in a tree map format, it really shows you how everything rolls up to meet the overall goal of the project, right? It's a document that I love to use before the project schedule is fully completed, right? Um, and even after that, I really like to use it. Um, I bring it to different meetings, things like that. The leadership doesn't need to see the whole project plan, right? That's really for you as a person that's managing the project. Um, they don't need to see that at every meeting. Yes, some of the meetings you want to bring some components of that, but you don't need all of that. This is a nice, you know, one to two page document that kind of rolls everything up in a really nice way visually um, for people to be able to see and understand, you know, after you've collected all these requirements, how things are piecing together to meet the overall vision of the project, right? Um, so it's a really useful document. Um, and once you complete it, you can take those activities, how you've written it, and I'll go through the levels in a second, and just transfer them right over into a project schedule and then build out the rest of the components, the responsibilities, the durations, timeframes, predecessors, all of that. Um, it'll make your life so much easier if you already have the work breakdown structure developed, you can just transfer everything over. Now, the WBS is traditionally developed in four levels, okay? So level one is the project, right? You can put the title of the project, the goal of the project, right? I like to put that there as well, um, but that's your level one. And I'll put this on the screen as well. Level two are all your deliverables or all your phases, okay? So for the sickle cell project, if it was deliverable based, one is the development of the actual care plan, right? I would put it on a Word document. And then another deliverable would be us integrating it into the EHR, right? Or the electronic health record, right? If it is construction of a home, um, I live in Florida. I watch a lot of HGTV. <laughs> so if it was a phase-based uh, work breakdown structure, right? You could start with the excavation, right? And then once you're excavated, you have to put your plumbing down and pour your foundation, right? And then once you do that, you can build the walls, then put your tresses on, all of that, right? So it's sequential, right? One thing has to happen after the other, um, but it tells you the order of things, right? Where the deliverables may not necessarily tell you the order of things, but it tells you the key things that have to be um, provided, right? Your key outputs of the project. So that's the, the difference there. Now, level three are going to be your work packages, right? Or the different outputs that are going to be needed in order to deliver that particular deliverable, right? Um, and so for the excavation of the house, right? You have to actually do the digging, right? Um, you have to order the machinery, then you have to dig. So, you know, you have to get the plans, right? That tell you where to dig, all of that. So those are gonna be your different work packages. Um, and then level four, right, going a uh, even more deeper into it, what activities do you have to do in order to be able to achieve that output, right? So for example, if you need the plans, right, to tell you where you need to dig, you need to get an architect, right? The architect needs to develop an architectural plan, and then you need to see what his measurements are, mark it on the ground, and then the machinery is ordered and the machinery knows where to dig up the dirt, right? All of that are the kind of the key activities that need to happen in order to produce that output. I hope that makes sense. But again, I'll put it on the screen for you. So that leads into our sixth term, which is a project schedule. OK, um, so you had your work breakdown structure, right? If you did that, then you're easily able to transfer all of the activities using those same levels into a project schedule. And now you need to add your durations, right? Which tells you how long each task is going to take. You can add the person responsible for completion of that, any resources that you're going to need in terms of staffing or products that you need to purchase or contract out for all of that. Um, you put your timeframes in there. Um, so this really gives you a comprehensive plan as to how you're going to complete the project and yes this is very waterfall not something that you're going to be able to do in an agile project right but project schedules you're going to have all of this defined at the front end now you want a tool that's going to help you to do this in a more automated and seamless way right there are plenty of tools out there i've used Rike, i've used Siloxis, i've used smartsheet um, there's so many tools out there so you want to make sure if you can right if your organization permits that you can you can use a tool that can kind of make this easier right microsoft project can also do this as well um yes you can do it in excel right but i find that excel project schedule are going to be either really complex or oversimplified to the point where that key functionality is not going to be there right and you can miss some things right um these automated tools can tell you you know when you you have late um 
tasks that need to be done, right? When people are overstaffed, all of that, it could really get into some things that are really helpful for you when monitoring and controlling your project, right? Whereas Excel may not be able to do that so seamlessly. Um, so, you know, you have to use what is available to you, um, but I would try to use a more automated tool versus Excel. Either way, you need to make sure you know project schedule and how to build one. Um, very important piece of the project. So the next term, and I mentioned this previously, is triple constraint, okay? Now this tells you what your project looks like in terms of scope, time, and resources, right? Um, if a change happens on your project, you need to understand how things are going to be affected, right? If you have a change in scope, then you may have a change in time, right? If you have a change in time, you may have a change in resources, right? Something is going to impact the next, right? It is connected, all right? And I'll put this on the screen for you to see visually as well. But one, if you impact one, it's going to impact something else. Something's got to give, right? Um, and so if a risk comes to fruition, if a change happens, you need to make sure that in terms of scope, time, and resources, you can figure out what's going to be the impact and be able to communicate that to leadership, make sure everyone's okay with that because then you're going to have to change something on the project, right? And when I say resources, I mean personnel, right? Staffing, um, and I also mean the actual products, right? Um, and that has a cost associated with it. So scope, time, and budget, or scope, time, and cost, right? People use different frames, but that's essentially what um, that means. So the eighth term is baseline. Now, this is a really important term as well because essentially when you develop and finalize your project plan, you wanna take a snapshot of what the plan looks like, right? What are the dates, who's responsible, what tasks are in there, because that may change throughout the project, right? If you don't have that initial snapshot and you continue to take snapshots every time you change, but if you don't have that initial snapshot, you're not gonna know where you started, right? Um, if a change took place and it's gonna add five days to 10 days to the project plan, you want to be able to see that difference in time, right? By knowing where you started. And yes, you may keep it in your head or you may forget after the fifth change, right? You may forget. So you want to take snapshots, right? And you can re-baseline the project, meaning you have one baseline from the original state, right? And then a project happens, uh, sorry, a change happens and you go ahead, update the plan, right? And then you re-baseline it, meaning you take another screenshot and these are the new dates, right? Um, if you are doing this in Excel, you can go ahead and save as, and you don't edit that version. You put it in a folder, you know, a baselines folder. So you can see different snapshots of where the project is. Um, if you're using one of those automated tools that I talked about that are great for project management, um, then you'll be able to quickly navigate easily through the different baselines of the project, right? Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that you do this because you want to know where you intended, right, to be um, and where you are. You want to be able to see that difference, all right? And baselining helps you to do that. So, so my next term is risks. Now, again, I keep saying things are important, but these are my top 10, right? Risks are important, okay? Now, this can definitely be taboo, I find, because when you're asking for people to define risks, they either think, you know, is it that you think I'm not doing my job well, right? Or certain leadership may not want to include risk, right? It's in, a, it's in the project charter, technically, right? But they may not want to include it because if they're pitching the project, they don't want leadership to know that there are risks all of that, right? But you want to make sure that you're driving home the point, right? That this is potentially what could happen, right? Not what has happened. These are things that could happen that can take your project off track. And all we're trying to do is get ahead of that, right? And plan for that in the beginning so that if it happens, right? We don't know if it will, but if it does, we already have a plan in place, right? And it's not going to stop us from sticking to the original plan, right? So drive home the point that all this is, is how we get ahead of things. What could happen, not what has happened, okay? So you do risk planning at the beginning of the project, right? Prior to even writing the project schedule, because once you have your mitigation plan in place for your risks, right, you can actually build that into your project schedule um, ahead of time, right? Um, but you want to do this planning prior to the project schedule development, and sometimes it may happen even after that. Um, once you identify your risks, you want to evaluate them, right? And you're looking at, in terms of evaluation, you're looking at the impact or the severity of this risk, right? If it was to happen, how bad would this be, right? You need to be able to um, 
understand that and evaluate that, right? A lot of people like to use a scale. I'll go ahead and pop one up on the screen for you as an example, right? Um, you can use, you know, a scale one, two, and three, one being the lowest severity, three being the highest, right? Um, and then you also want to look at the likelihood that this will happen or the probability that this thing will take place, right? How likely is this to even take place, right? And if it does, how severe will it be, right? It's a combination of those two things in order to evaluate it. And once you evaluate it, right, you need to plan for how you're going to handle this if it should come to fruition. Now, there are four ways that you can handle a risk, right? You can just accept it, right? And you have your mitigation plan in place, right? Accept it, this is what, if this happens, we, we already know what to do about it, right? You can completely avoid it, right? Um, try to stop it from even taking place. You could also reduce it, right? Reduce, right? Lessen the blow, if you will, right? That's something you can do. And then you could also transfer it, right? Which means you can get a contractor or someone else to deal with this problem should it happen, right? So there are four different ways you can handle that. Um, and you want to do that all in your mitigation planning of your risk. So document them, right? There's something called a risk register um, where you could document the risk itself. You have um, the impact and severity or the probability or likelihood, you have those scores, you have a general score, kind of putting those two things together, right? Calculating those two things together. And you can see how how high on this risk plan is, is this risk? How much should we pay attention to this thing? Who would be responsible for it should it happen, right? And then what's the mitigation plan, right? Um, so that's the risk register. It's something that can help you to track these things because again, this is going to be really important. And again, you wanna make sure you do this at the front end so that if it happens, you already know how to handle it. So my 10th term, right, is project status reports. Again, very important. At any point during your project, right, as the project manager, you need to know where your project is, right? What's being completed? What risks are you facing? Right? What issues are coming up? Um, how, how far into the project plan are we, right? Are we having staffing issues? Are we having budget issues? You need to know where your project is, okay? And your status reports can help you do that, right? Help you to understand that and also help others to understand that, right? We talked about a communication plan and you wanna use these documents to facilitate that communication plan. Now, there are multiple types of reports that can support your project. Um, you can do more quantitative reports that tell you the percent complete, percent of tasks late, percent of tasks, you know, that have been completed or implemented or in progress, right? The percent of tasks assigned to a certain person and how much they've completed, right? Really quantitative reports, right? And depending on who your stakeholder is and how they like to see information, that can be a report that is really helpful for them, right? Um, and then you can have more qualitative reports, right? Something, for example, like a top two or a top three report that tells you what are your top two accomplishments for this week and what are the things that are up coming for you, right? What are the things that you're working on? Um, but, you know, more kind of information-based, word-based versus numbers-based, numerical. Um, so, and then you can have dashboards, right? Which is kind of a combination of both, right? Dashboards can have some of these numerical snapshot pieces of information and then also kind of get more into the, the details in a more qualitative way. Um, so dashboards are great for that as well. Um, again, you want to communicate to people in the way that best fits their need and their communication style, right? We talked about that in a previous video. Um, so very important. You want to make sure you know where your project is and you want to make sure that you're communicating that well throughout the project implementation. So those are my top 10 tips. Comment below, what are some of the terms that you guys are hearing most often, right? If you're in project management or you're in the field somehow, project coordinator, whatever the case may be, what are some of those terms that you're hearing over and over again? Maybe we could do a part two. Okay, like this video if you found it helpful. Make sure you go ahead and subscribe. If you are looking to master the role of a PM, I will be putting out videos each week. Um, and thank you again so much for watching. See you in my next one. Bye.